Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, the co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the CLL Society. Dr. Stevens? Hi, I'm Debbie Stevens, and I'm a CLL expert at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I lead the CLL and Richter's program here. Dr. Stevens, you recently wrote a paper that really caught my attention, and it had to do with bone health and thinning of the bone osteoporosis and CLL. And we know that CLL lives in the bone marrow, so it makes sense that it would affect the bone. But this seems to have been in a neglected area of research. Can you talk to us a little about why you were interested in this, what you were seeing in your patients, and what your research showed us? Sure. Thanks for your interest in this. And we all know that CLL causes a lot of different complications other than just progression of CLL. And, you know, things that we're very well of are second cancers, infections, things like that. But I suspect that there's a lot of other complications that are not really at the top of our mind. Um, this uh, idea to do research in this area came to me because I had a patient um, that came in and she had multiple uh, fractures in her spine. And these are called vertebral compression fractures. And she said, you know, doc, I know my CLL is in my bone marrow. Is it possible that the fact that I had CLL is what made me have these compression fractures? And I thought that was a really Im important question. And I said, you know, I, I think that makes sense. And I, I want to look and see if there's any evidence that this has ever been reported. Um, and I did a literature search and I found one article from many years ago that was a very large population-based um, article that said there's maybe an increased risk of osteoporosis in folks who have CLL, um, but they said it was hard to tell because the risk for osteoporosis uh, occurs as you get older and the risk for CLL occurs as you get older. But one thing I thought was really interesting is there was an increased rate of these vertebral compression fractures. And again, you know, your, your vertebrae are kind of shaped like a rectangle. And what happens instead of like a long bone when that breaks, it snaps in two, this basically the bone just kind of collapses on itself. So it's called a compression fracture and it can be really painful for people. And so, you know, anything I could do to prevent a patient from having to go through the pain of that, I thought, you know, maybe there's, there's more out there. And so what I did is I partnered with um, one of the endocrinologists at my institution who specialized in bone health, um, somebody who treats a lot of osteoporosis. And what we did is we looked through all of the, you know, we looked through diagnosis codes of folks at our institution. And basically diagnosis codes are what your doctor puts in your note as, you know, the diagnosis that you've seen them for. So we look for any codes for people who had a diagnosis of CLL and either had a diagnosis of osteoporosis, which is kind of a generalized bone thinning and puts you at risk of fractures, um, or something called a fragility fracture. And basically what a fragility fracture means is it's a fracture that happens kind of spontaneously or with a force that's not, you wouldn't normally think would break a bone. So, you know, just for example, I sometimes see patients that, um, you know, you would think, oh, if I got in a car accident, of course, I'm going to fracture bones. But I see, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I was just digging in my garden and I, I put my shovel in too hard. And then I just had a big pain in my back. And it turns out they have a, you know, compression fracture. So you wouldn't think that that would be something that would um, cause a fracture. And so that's what is defined as a fragility fracture. Most yeah, common I've places patients where they have fractured a wrist bone, just opening a jar, you know, just right, twisting right, exactly. open a jar and then there's excruciating pain and they have a, a small fracture. Yeah, exactly. And so those fractures, um, as I mentioned, happen in the back, as you just mentioned, they happened in the, the wrist bones, the smaller bones of the wrist sometimes can happen in the hips or um, in the pelvic bones, things like that. And so basically we looked at all the patients who had CLL and either had a diagnosis of osteoporosis or had one of these fragility fractures. And we came up with a list of uh, just under 100 patients um, that met these criteria. 
And then we wanted to look at them and say, you know, were these patients screened well for osteoporosis? Thinking, is there any way we could have prevented these fractures? Um, we also wanted to look at the different characteristics that they had, you know, either based on their CLL, so their, you know, risk factors, the genetic risk factors in their CLL cells, or, you know, other things, other medical problems like diabetes and smoking and immune suppression, which are also associated with um, osteoporosis. So what we found um, on two fronts, number one, um, I don't feel like people were screened well enough for these fractures. So um, when, we, uh, when we determined this, only about half of people um, were screened before they got um, one of these fragility fractures. And what screening is involved is looking at a scan called a DEXA scan, which basically tells you how dense your bones are. And so, you know, half of the people weren't even screened um, uh, to tell this. And then after the patient had a fragility fracture, about half of them didn't go on to get, you know, screened for additional osteoporosis or even treated for osteoporosis. And the, the typical treatments that we use for osteoporosis, you know, could be something like um, uh, bisphosphonates um, or um, rank L inhibitors like denosumab or, or prolia. And so basically, you know, people weren't screened very well for this. They also, you know, after we found out that they had a fracture, they weren't, you know, treated to prevent another um, fracture very well. And then the other thing that we found that's a little bit frustrating is usually when, you know, I guess standard run of the mill osteoporosis, why we screen for it is because there's a score that comes out of the DEXA scan called a T-score. And if that score is low enough, we know this patient is at high risk of having a fracture and they need you know, treatment XYZ to treat their osteoporosis and prevent. However, the majority of the people who actually had these fragility fractures did not have, they would not have even been screened as very high risk by their DEXA scan because their T-score um, was higher than you would expect it to be for somebody who would have a fragility fracture. Um, so what that tells us is probably, although DEXA scans are, are still good and they still should be used to screen for osteoporosis, it probably doesn't tell us the full story in patients that have CLL. There's likely other factors. Um, you know, some of these other factors might be, you know, CLL is made in the bone marrow. And so maybe the structure of the bones is not, you know, as strong as somebody who doesn't have CLL. And so they're at higher risk for that. And and, and maybe the DEXA scans don't pick up well on this. Um, so I think, you know, what we learned is, you know, we're, we're not paying attention to this as a risk factor very well, and people should really be aware of this and make sure that they're getting screened for osteoporosis. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, we need to come up with better ways, you know, we need to research, you know, more, how does this happen? And, and what, what is unique about patients with CLL that this is happening? And so we can best um, treat this and prevent these fractures from happening. And I understand that you're looking at actually using a structural engineer to look at the way the bone is made in CLL, if it's different than the way the bone is made in someone without CLL. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of midway through this research process. And what I've done is, you know, um, patients who had signed up for something called a tissue bank at our institution, which basically means you know, when we're doing a procedure for something else, we can collect extra tissue. Um, we've actually collected uh, bone marrow samples from people who either have a lot of CLL in their bone marrow or are in remission. So maybe we were doing a bone marrow to prove that they were in remission after therapy. Um, and what the structural engineer is, you know, they take this little bitty bone marrow um, core and they do something called a micro CT scan on it. And this micro CT scan, it can tell, you know, how much of the normal components of bone, what, what is that this particular bone composed of? Because you can have fat cells, of course, you have minerals, you know, marrow, other things. And so trying to figure out the difference, you know, and what does a, a marrow look like that is full of CLL cells versus, you know, a patient who has CLL, but they're in remission, you know, is there a difference in those two bone marrow samples? And, you know, that might help us to understand why it's happening. So maybe, you know, 
maybe just for example, if there's too many fat cells, like is there a treatment that we can do to prevent from being so many fat cells? Or, you know, if there's proteins that are being um, excreted or eliminated, you know, help us to understand how to best combat this in the future. Well, th and that's where I want to go with this too. And if I know that this is very early, but generally, you know, patients should be on calcium supplementation um, mm -hmm. and vitamin D. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are pretty important. And we know that weight bearing exercise is very important mm -hmm. for um, um, uh, preventing and treating osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of medications that work for this. Do you have any sense of that? And are, do you think these are being underutilized or any advice for a patient in terms of when they talk? with their hematologist or with their primary care provider mm -hmm. about what they should be doing in this regard? Yes. Um, and I, as you just brought up, I think really a, a very easy thing to do is to take calcium supplementation and vitamin D supplementation, because that helps to build, um, you know, bone structure and density and, you know, kind of standard um, recommendations would be to do 1200 milligrams of calcium and two divided doses during the day and at least 800 units of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is a test that your doctor can do. And if your levels are low, they might suggest a higher dose of vitamin D until you can get those levels up. Um, as you just mentioned, doing you know those weight-bearing exercises are important. Um, although a lot of your bone density forms, um, you know, when you're 30 or 40 years old, and so that helps. It doesn't, you know, it, it won't completely eliminate the risk. But um, building the muscles, I think, also prevents you from falling. Yeah, some absolutely. Of, some, it's some of that having that muscle protection around the bones too mm -hmm. I, is part yeah. of it too helps yeah. with your balance. All of those other things, yeah. Yeah, and uh, in general, you know, just talking about general and not specifically to CLL, uh, it seems that women are at higher risk of osteoporosis over time. But what we found in our study actually is that men were at higher risk of getting these fractures. And so I don't know if that's because, you know, men aren't as likely to get screened for osteoporosis with a DEXA scan um, and, and do something to prevent. I don't, I don't know exactly why that is, that we saw a little bit higher um, risk um, in the male folks who had these fractures. But, you know, talking to your primary care doctor, because guidelines um, suggest that folks over the age of 65 should be screened with a DEXA scan at least, um, you know, every two years. And, you know, if you find that you are in the osteoporosis range, might need one more frequently based on um, your doctor's recommendations. That's something that your primary care doctor um, should be able to uh, refer you for. And I know you work with an endocrinologist, but if you do find that you have osteoporosis, um, are the treatments safe for people with CLL? Um, I, I think there's always a question of, you know, um, is the risk out, you know, or is there, does the benefit of treatment outweigh the risk? And I would say in general, yes. Um, you know, some of the treatments like the bisphosphonates, um, there are some severe side effects, but those are quite rare to happen. Um, you may have heard about something called osteonecrosis of the jaw, which basically means that, you know, the bone in the jaw gets softer and that, that can be a severe side effect, but that's actually quite rare. Usually physicians recommend um, that their patients get a dental screening before they start these kind of treatments, just because if there are, you know, abscessed teeth or or teeth that need to be removed, it's better to do that before starting. You know, I, I personally think that drugs like denosumab or uh, Prolia are probably better treatments for folks who have CLL, just because there have been data shown that there are um, chemicals that the CLL um, secretes that can impact bone density, and denosumab actually directly works on those specific um, chemicals called RANK uh, or RANK-L. Um, and so I think those might be, um, you know, potentially better treatments, but something that I, I'm really interested in studying further, um, specifically for folks who have CLL. This is really important. And I, I think, you know, as we're living longer and longer with CLL, these other issues become increasingly important. Any final thoughts that you want to share with the patient community about their bone health and CLL? 
Yeah, I think, you know, just as important as keeping up with your other second cancer screenings and getting vaccines to prevent infection, you know, think about talking with your doc doctors about screening for, for bone health and bone density health. Think about taking those calcium and vitamin D supplementation um, and really being screened um, for osteoporosis to prevent these kind of fractures from happening. Uh, Dr. Stevens, thanks so much for this. I'm so glad that you're looking into an area that people really should be looking into and, and you're kind of leading that charge. Thank you so much for all the research you're doing. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me here today.